So that is our final survivor voice, um, apart from the documentary. Is that right? That's right. So if we move to the documentary with just a, a repeating the warning that you were going yes. to... Yes. Um, for those who uh, weren't watching earlier, we're now about to watch a 40-minute documentary. Uh, it uh, contains images of uh, survivors, uh, both in New Zealand and Australia. It also contains images, pictures of uh, some of the St John of God brothers who were, have been convicted and other brothers um, who were subject to reports of abuse. If you think that seeing these pictures, these images, these, uh, for this film, uh, with these people in it is going to affect you, is going to trigger you, is going to make you um, react badly, then please feel free to turn off the video at this stage uh, for 40 minutes. Uh, and if you wish to engage again, turn on again after 40 minutes. But do take care of yourself um, and don't watch it if you think that it's going to be harmful to you. Thank you, Ms Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was at Meridans in 1955. We were treated like hell. I hated that place. I still dream about it, you know? And this is what I believe. Those brothers that were in those homes, they were interfering with kids. And why did they move into New Zealand anyway? Why didn't they stay in bloody Aussie? Sydney's Downing Centre criminal courts have been kept busy with trials of child sex abusers. Six floors up, the trial of a brother from the Order of St. John of God was about to get underway. Bernard McGrath has come straight from prison, where he's already serving a 33-year sentence. I think one camera is directed towards me that we're looking for my reactions. Bernard McGrath would be amongst the worst serial sexual predators Australia has ever seen. Uh, he's left a trail of devastation across two countries now, Australia and New Zealand. When you look at the victims, the thing that strikes me the most is not just the sheer quantity of them, it's the brutality that went with it. Okay. Mm. Let's get the jury, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. He in total has been found guilty of abusing 47 boys to date. And do you believe there are more? Yes. Bernard McGrath's rap sheet is so extensive that before his current trial, he'd already been sentenced to a cumulative 39 and a half years in jail. There were two trials in New Zealand and Australia in the 1990s. You were there to be their protector. But the dreadful thing is that, in fact, you were their abuser. His third trial was back in New Zealand in 2006. The total sentence is five years imprisonment. Then in 2018, for crimes at Kendall Grange, McGrath was sentenced to a further 33 years jail. The undeniable fact remains that this offender knowingly engaged in a deliberate course of prolonged and serious sexual abuse. His offences in both countries were against boys aged between 7 and 13, ranging in severity from sexual molestation to many counts of anal rape. Yes, thank you, Mr. Crown. Thank you. Your Honour, I'm going to ask the court officer to bring up on the screen a picture yes. that depicts 
the buildings and the surrounds of the Kendall Grange School. Here in 1978, the Order of St John of God appointed Brother Bernard McGrath to the teaching staff of a special school for boys. A lot of us, we had nowhere else to go but Kendall Grange. That was our last hope. Not yet. It was either you had troubles at home or at school or both. Growing up as a kid, I was dyslexic and my mother found a place that would take me because I was a bit out of control and I got moved to Kendall Grange. This order is 450 years old, so it's a very old culture. Brothers from St John of God were sent to Australia in 1947 on a mission to establish a special school for boys. They came from Ireland. Uh, the Archbishop of Sydney wrote to the head of the St John of God brothers uh, in Rome and said, we really like some brothers out here in Australia. They're experts in mental health. So they sent a brother from Ireland to Sydney and they moved up to Morissette and founded the order up there. Was there any hint of there being pedophile activity early on? Oh, yes. Um, the uh, brother who started Australia was joined quite quickly in the following years by five other brothers from Ireland. Each of them have serious complaints of child sexual abuse from the very start. I mean, the whole ethos of St. John of God is to look after the most vulnerable. You know, it dates back hundreds and hundreds of years ago. That's why they were set up. And you've got a rotten core of them who have just used it as their own playground to identify and select and molest children, the most vulnerable children. In 1982, 11-year-old Jason Van Dyke had just arrived at Kendall Grange, where Brother Bernard was headmaster and in charge of one of the dorms. He's, you know, coming into your bed and laying on you, basically. There were hands going down your pants and him rubbing himself on you and a tongue going in your mouth. You didn't know what was going on. As a kid, you don't ask questions. You don't know how. We'd get cigarettes and get to drive the van. That's when he started putting his hand on my leg while I was driving, and it progressively got worse to masturbation, of him masturbating me, me masturbating him. Then to the worst was, um, where well, I was in the bedroom and he put his penis between my legs and proceeded to ejaculate. The tragedy for these and all the young victims at Kendall Grange was that McGrath should never have been sent there. The order had received reports that he'd molested children at the boarding school where he taught in New Zealand before coming to Australia. In the trial, the jury will be presented evidence of McGrath's crimes at the school in Christchurch. Maryland's was an institution remarkably similar to Kendall Grange. The main thing would be the isolation. Most of these victims have come from either, you know, one parent families. Some of them have no family support. They had some learning and some of them had physical disabilities as well. Yeah, I think it was about age nine when I first went to Maryland's. At first I thought it was 
well, quite okay, but then uh, over the years, I couldn't stand living with them down in crisis any longer than that I need to. Uh, Brother Celsus Griffin, he was the one I went to when I first went there. Brother Griffin, he hit me around the back of the ears with his fists for talking when we weren't supposed to be. And then he punched me on the jaw, got me out and put me on the ground and kicked me and punched me. They've come to us because we fulfil a need for them. That people outside, the doctors, psychologists, teachers, consider that we can do something that the other people have failed to do with these children. My brother Keane, he was the, uh, the headmaster at the school. Uh, brother Delaney, he, he was the prior at the school. And your brother Garcia, he, he was there at the time. And, and Rafe or Dylan, Raphael, he sexually abused me. Yeah, we've been doing some work and we missed out on, on our showers. We got asked to do some cleaning up in his flat, so we did that. And then he said we could have a shower there. I got out the shower and then Raphael had me on my back on the floor just ask if we just try to pause this for a moment. I've just got a te technical difficulty with the live streaming of this. Okay. So I just wonder if we can take um, a two minute pause two um, just to get the technology right so that it's actually those who are watching on the live stream can also participate in this yeah. video. All right. So we'll just take, we'll take a break. You let us know when we'll come I'll back. I'll wait to hear from the back of the room as to when we can press go again. All right. Thank you. I've been told it's appropriate if I issue the warning again. Is that right or not? Um, I think um, in terms of the timing, Madam Chair, we seem to have some feedback on that mm. system. Um, in terms of the timing, I think if at about 11.15, if we pause, if Madam Registrar pauses um, the video at that time and for you to reissue the warning, just in case... That would be the time that somebody that might people be might be tuning back in again. Rejoining back All in. Right. Thank just you. to explain that it's been delayed. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Anderson. You. Paused. We will resume soon. get cigarettes and get to drive the van. That's when he started putting his hand on my leg while I was driving and it progressively got worse to masturbation of him masturbating me, me masturbating him. Then to the worst was um, where I was in the bedroom and he put his penis between my legs and proceeded to ejaculate. The tragedy for these and all the young victims at Kendall Grange was that McGrath should never have been sent there. The order had received reports that he'd molested children at the boarding school where he taught in New Zealand before coming to Australia. In the trial, the jury will be presented evidence of McGrath's crimes at the school in Christchurch. Maryland's was an institution remarkably similar to Kendall Grange. The main thing would be the isolation. Most of these victims have come from either, you know, one-parent families. Some of them have no family support. 
they had some learning and some of them had physical disabilities as well. Yeah, I think it was about age nine when I first went to Maryland's. At first I thought it was, well, quite okay, but then uh, over the years, I couldn't stand living with them down in crushes any longer than that I need to. My uh, brother Celsus Griffin, he was the one I went to when I first went there. Brother Griffin, he hit me around the back of the ears with his fists for talking when we weren't supposed to be. And then he punched me on the jaw, got me on and put me on the ground and kicked me and punched me. They've come to us because we fulfil a need for them that people outside, the doctors, psychologists, teachers, consider that we can do something that the other people have failed to do with these children. My brother Keane, he was the, uh, the headmaster at the school. Uh, brother Delaney, he, he was the prior at the school and your brother Garcha, he, he was there at the time in Rafael Dillon. Raphael. He sexually abused me. Yeah, we've been doing some work when we missed out on, on our showers. We got asked to do some cleaning up in his flat, so we did that. And then he said we could have a shower there. I got out the shower and then Raphael had me on my back on the floor and he was tried to have sexual intercourse and I says no, I resisted. Called me a small sport and told me to go, get dressed and go, so I did. I can't remember the very early age, I think I was about seven years. It started off with me giving a brother a, a bath. Have you washed all of me? Yes, I have. Fondling himself and letting me fondle him. Later on down the track, blow jobs. Um, and me entering from the back and I never ever 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 told anyone <laughs> the New Zealand police started investigating allegations of sexual offending by the brothers at the Maryland school in May of 2003 the accused was interviewed by the New Zealand police about the allegations that were made there. Right, the machine's going now, Vernon. So we're here at the Grosjean Central Police Station on Durban 11. The date's 22nd of May 2003, and the time is 13.24. I'm Detective Sean Buckley, and so I'm Detective John Borlase. So it's, there's a fair bit for us to go through, obviously, uh, today. In my mind, if pedophiles had their entire offending period of their life to sit up and wait for this day, the day they're going to be interviewed. So they've got a backstory ready. It was hell. We actually just lived in hell. We didn't know what we were doing. You know? We controlled by fear. We absolutely just controlled by fear. You know, it certainly described to me that when he lost his temper, he would lose it in a large way. So he could go from zero to a hundred very, very quickly. Were they crying? Were they upset? Oh, I can't remember anybody crying, no. Hysterical? No, I can't remember anybody hysterical. Frightened? They would have been frightened, I, I would admit you that, yeah. Well, they must have been. And he's also very manipulative. He had a small group of older boys who, who had all been his victims, um, and he was able to manipulate them into going out and getting younger boys. 
defending that, that you can recall that took place, can you list off the different places around the school where that happened? In my bedroom, in the classroom. In the classroom. Oh, yeah, I was sick of it, wasn't I? I was real sick. He's claimed on many occasions that he never anally penetrated anyone. Yeah. So he's smart enough to know that if he ever admitted to any penetrative acts, sodomy or oral sex, that his sentencing would go up considerably. Some of the boys have said that there was anal sex taking place. No, there was no anal sex. There wasn't. There wasn't. And I will say this in court. Or are you just minimalising it? I'm not minimalising it. No, I'm not. I am not minimising it. I'm not. I'm not. As soon as admissions of penetrative acts comes in, it's a whole new ball game for him. But all I can say is that is not one of my sins. And God Almighty is my judge. And I'm prepared to go to my grave tonight and face that. Really prepared for that fucking hell I am now when you throw that at me. He had a number of excuses as to why that could never have occurred. And did it occur? Definitely, yeah. We had um, a number of victims who talked about being sodomised by Bernard. You know, these are young boys and they clearly remember the pain that was incurred and, you know, the, the physical and the mental trauma that went with that. Bernard McGrath wasn't the only brother who sexually abused boys at institutions run by St John of God. We wish it never had happened. It has happened, but life goes on. You are seeing the human face of religious life. A man in a suit, just like everybody else, has his strengths and weaknesses, and sometimes there has been a weakness. The Royal Commission found this small order had the highest proportion of alleged child sex offenders of any Catholic institution. With great sadness, we have to acknowledge that some brothers, stretching back to the 1950s, have done dreadful things. Of the 112 brothers, 40% were alleged offenders. Tell me about the sexual culture. How did it breed? How did it come into being? By the older brothers. So if you look at the likes of William Lebler, he was there on and off for long periods of time. A particularly brutal individual. He's had free reign for a good number of years, so he's set the tone, both with his physical brutality, but also with his sexual offending. I was abused by Brother Thaddeus, otherwise known as William Lieber. The abuse occurred in the hoppers. He was me in his chair and found my own groin area from the sands of my clothing to start with. Eventually it um yeah progress to um pants down um and six both ways and digital penetration by his brother for days. He used to get me upstairs. Well, I call it a newspaper room. He had his smock on, as they like to call it. And he got me put my hand in. He had his nail inside underneath it to hold his uh, penis at first. Got me to put my mouth over it. And I remember one day he took me up there and I started to cry and then my eyes get, you know. And, um, she left me alone after that. And why didn't all of us boys say anything about our sexual abuse? Because of the brothers of St. John of God. They were godly, bloody people, mate. We would have been brand as bloody liars back then. Shit stirs. Of course we're not going to say anything. 
the brothers were held in very high regards within the whole area. So there was nowhere to go for safety. And it just went on and on and on. Out of the group that went on to become offenders, I think the majority of them have learnt to do it and have been provided with the opportunity to do it. We've got Roger Maloney, who was also somewhat of a senior brother at that stage. Garcha, he had multiple victims in both New Zealand and Australia. And then we have Vernon McGrath as well. granted entry to the maximum security prison in New South Wales, where Bernard McGrath is locked away from the world. We've come looking for answers as to how McGrath was able to get away with so many crimes against children for so long and in so many places. We're pausing the uh, live stream at this moment um, because earlier I said that the live stream would take 40 minutes and that people who were, thought they would be triggered should turn off for 40 minutes. We had a technical um, uh, delay in the middle of the viewing, which has meant that the viewing time has been extended. So if you have rejoined believing that the, here, the video is over, it is not. Um, and uh, I think we can expect it will be for how much longer? Madam Chair, I think we've got um, another um, 20 minutes. Another 20 make. minutes. So I suggest that you, you come back at about quarter to 12. And well, you'll... we'll likely take a pause after this. Yeah. Um, so it's likely midday would be the appropriate Mid time for people to rejoin. All right, then. So be, come, back, come back at midday to rejoin um, as, if you want to avoid watching the rest of the uh, video. Thank you. You said that the vow of chastity, yeah. the not looking on women, is one of the reasons why you had sex with children. I want you to explain that. My understanding at the time was um, uh, very limited um, about the vow of chastity it was just no sex and so in some distorted thinking if i i turned to somebody who it was safer and that meant a child that meant a young person yeah i want to understand how it is that the children came to bear the brunt of your sexual desires um i was that was the environment that i was working within it was an institution for troubled teenagers and young people so it was an opportunity it was they were there. An opportunity, yeah. How did you get away with it? Well, I didn't get away with it really. You did for a long time. For a long time. Mm. Um, because I suppose no one said anything. There were a large number of pedophiles operating in the order, though. Were those pedophiles protecting each other from discovery? Do you think? I don't think they were, because I don't think you went around telling other people. It's the thing that I think stretches credulity, that you could have a number of men who are abusing vulnerable children, that you did not talk to each other about what you were doing. No, we didn't. No. Never? Not a word. Not a word. You didn't talk about the children and never. who would make a good victim? No, not at all. I never heard conversations like that at Marylands or Kendallgrange or even at Burwood. Yeah. I can see that, uh, well, I suppose the place will eventually close down. At the Maryland School in Christchurch, McGrath's boss and the headmaster was brother Roger Maloney. Maloney had supervised his training in the order. They have sort of been brothers in arms in some ways. They're both well aware of what each other's doing, and then they've just gone off and offended at will in Maryland's. Including sharing boys. Including, victims. yeah, including mm -hmm. that. What was Maloney doing to children at Maryland's? I don't know what he was doing, but I only witnessed one incident. He abused a child in front of you? Well, he um, ran his hands down the person's front, yeah. Their groin? Groin, yeah. He was abusing that child? At that moment, yeah. Why would he do that in front of you? 
I think most probably he may have been saying, well, look, let's do it ourselves. Was he, he and I, you know. Was he inviting you to I, take part? I would say, um, I would say most probably it was like an invitation from him, yeah. Roger Maloney, he was sort of like standing in the, in the dining room and just sort of stare at you and made you slightly uncomfortable when you're having a meal with the boys and eventually I, I just sort of had to go to the, the boys' toilets at that time and that's... Well, when it happened, I only just finished washing my hands and he had me pinned up against the wall and well, he, he, he touched me uh, down, down in front of me when I, uh, when I was up against the wall and well, he, he, he wanted me to do the same thing to him and I, I didn't want to and I somehow eventually left the boys towards it and went straight back to people section and It was only when I heard it on the radio years ago, asking one of the brothers uh, uh, about the, what's happening. Well, that's when I had to mention it to my sister too. Because I couldn't. Sorry. In 1977, complaints of abuse at the school reached the headquarters of St John of God in Sydney. A meeting was subsequently called of the brothers at Maryland's. Brother Maloney did say that the provincial office and the authorities, the senior members of the order had received a something saying that something was going on. The sexual abuse of children, that was the something. Did he, did he say those words? I can't remember. But the meaning but was clear. But that's what, uh, the meaning was clear to me, yes. Why wouldn't the leadership go to police? The church knew it was a crime, so why didn't they do something about it? I don't know. I got moved, I think, shortly after that. Mm -hmm. I got my letter of obedience to um, report to the prior at Kindle Grange. The audit knew exactly what was going on. There's no ifs or buts there. But instead of dealing with it, they shifted the problem on. So instead of there being five or six victims, just at Maryland's, it escalates, and now we're looking at hundreds of victims. The New Zealand police investigation led to the order's head at the time of the abuse, brother Brian O'Donnell. O'Donnell made the decision to move McGrath to Kendall Grange. Sean Buckley went looking for evidence in the order's archive. There was no documentation to say why McGrath had been moved from Maryland's to back to Australia. It was just said that it was just time for him to, to go. But detail of everything else, nothing about a major movement. Exactly. Do you believe that the Order of St John of God destroyed evidence of those movements? Yes, yeah. There, there's information that should be in the archives which are not, which is not there. Um, so I can only assume that it's been destroyed um, or taken out of the archives. What discussion was there about why you were being moved? There's no discussion. All moves are done by the provincial at the time in Sydney. Um, you never question those as an individual brother. That's just, yeah, I got the message, the new, the, the obedience to move, and I moved. Why did you think you were being moved? My hunch was because I had offended. Um, yeah, that was my hunch at the time. Fellow abuser Brother Maloney, a trained pharmacist, was sent to the Vatican, appointed as a pharmacist to the Pope. Now, Maloney at the same time was moved to the Vatican. Did you understand he was also moved because he was assaulting children? 
He was moved after I was moved. Um, that was my hunch. So when you look at that now, you have two men sexually assaulting children, both covered up by the head of the religious well, when order. When you look at it that way, yes, yeah. The order's cover-up continued into the early 1990s, when the new boss of St John of God, Joseph Smith, found himself having to deal with a growing number of complaints against McGrath. The only conversation I can remember with him is when he was uh, drove me into St Mary's. I haven't really thought of this in quite some time. Um, he drove me into St Mary's Which... to speak with some priest there. Brian Lucas? Yeah, that's it. yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. I've forgotten his name. In the 1990s, Father Brian Lucas was based at the presbytery at St Mary's Cathedral. A lawyer as well as a Catholic priest, Lucas was one of the most important figures in the church's response to child sexual abuse, leading the formation of the so-called Special Issues Resource Group. Brian Lucas has spent years fending off allegations that he was involved in a cover-up. He told the Royal Commission that his job was to help bishops or major superiors handle the person making a complaint and get the offender out of the business. In this capacity, he met more than 30 priests and brothers, including some of Australia's worst offenders. In none of these cases did he report them to the police. I, I may well have met with him. I don't deny that I met with him but I don't have a recollection of that meeting. I asked you to check, did you check? I found that I had a meeting certainly with St John of God Brothers, but I haven't made any other inquiries other than I concede that I may have met with Bernard McGrath. Do you remember meeting or talking to Joseph Smith? I, I suspect that Joseph Smith, who was a superior, probably brought Bernard McGrath along. What assurances did you give them about the level of protection that you were offering? Nothing further than that this was an off-the-record conversation I would maintain as confidential. Is that effectively the same level of secrecy as confession that you're offering? No. But is that why a number of people who came to see you talk about it in those terms, that you put it in terms of confessional secrecy? No. You asked me about, did I want to go to confession? Remember that. Because um, it's years since I'd been to that sacrament. I would never have said that and I would deny that I would have said that because it would be totally inappropriate ever. It's fundamental church law that you never ever hear the confession of someone you're dealing with in a disciplinary fashion. So if he said I said that, I'd absolutely deny it. What did you tell Lucas about what you had done? I told him I had offended. You told Brian Lucas of the full extent of your offending? Yes. I said to him, I can remember him asking a question. What question? I can remember him saying there would be others, and I can remember saying yes. Did he recommend that you should go to the police? I can't remember that being... You'd think you would remember the first if, mention if that, of the police. Exactly, so I'm trying to go back to think if he had... You must have been afraid of arrest. By this stage, there's a series of complaints that have been made in two countries about you sexually assaulting children, and you I... would face a prison term if the police got involved. Yeah, yeah. So did you report what McGraw was saying to the police? No. Why not? Because I didn't have any basis to do that. Because the context of that conversation had to respect his right to silence. That's a cover-up. Well, you might call it a cover-up. I think anybody in the community would call that a cover-up. No, I, I don't accept that. What do you mean by right to silence? He's telling you that he has assaulted children. Criminals have a right in not to the criminal. Criminal in the criminal justice system, not in an office behind St Mary's Cathedral talking to a priest? No, not when that conversation is premised on the basis that he has a right to silence and that this conversation is confidential. So his right to confidentiality is more important than justice? No, the justice... No, comes... you've made a decision. You have a choice. You can either hand Bernard McGrath over to the police or you can protect his right to confidentiality. You choose to protect Bernard McGrath. All what you can do is to entice him out of ministry with a view that in due course the criminal justice system will kick in. You hope, but you play no role in making that happen. That's true. So 
So what were they doing? In that sense, how you're saying it there now is like a cover-up. Is that what you think it was? Thinking about now, yes. I'd have to say yes. I just wanted to show you these pictures, actually, because sometimes this can become very removed. See these? These are the little boys who Bernard McGrath raped. Vulnerable children, all of them, at a special school in New Zealand. There's many, many more. Why would you protect someone? I wasn't protecting him. If you weren't protecting him, you would have handed him over to the police. Well, his order could have handed him over to the police. He could have given himself over to the police. His victims could have gone to the police. You think that these children bore the responsibility to end Bernard McGrath's offending, not you? No. What I'm saying is this. The limited role I had was to entice him out of ministry. Why so limited a role? Who, who puts the limits on your role? Well, that's what his superiors would have wanted me to do. And what about those children, those pictures I've just yeah. showed you? What about justice for them? Where does that fit in? Well, that's an important value. Except but... it appears to play no role whatsoever in what you did. Well, I'm sorry that that's the way you interpret it, but that was certainly not the intention. According to McGrath, Lucas raised the prospect of psychological treatment to address his crimes. I think he was the one that brought up about treatment. It was his idea to send you to America? Well, I don't know about it was going to America, but I think he mentioned treatment. Did you believe that pedophilia could be cured, that the offending of your priests and brothers could be cured? No, I don't know that it could be cured, but you could put them in a situation where you've taken them out of ministry and you removed much of the opportunity for offending. Why send them for treatment then, if they can't be cured? Well, it depends on the nature of what their offending was. Uh, some may not be cured, but some may learn how to manage their behaviour. Bernard McGrath was sent to the desert wilderness of the Jemez Valley in New Mexico, out of the reach of police in Australia and New Zealand, to a notorious Catholic-run treatment facility. The Jemez Springs operation was run by an order called the Servants of the Paraclete. McGrath was one of a number of serial pedophiles from Australia, including the notorious Victorian offender, Gerald Ridsdale, sent for treatment to this place, which defined itself as a repair shop for damaged priests and brothers. Well, it's like every automobile agency has a repair department. Well, sometimes a priest need repairs. Sometimes they're pretty well dented and bruised and beaten and scarred and scuffed. Come on in, we'll give you, a, we'll fix you up. How is it the best thing to have someone removed from the country and sent overseas when they've just admitted to committing a terrible crime? Well, it's a matter for victims to come forward and report those crimes. So you think that you have no responsibility before the law to report a crime? That depends on the context of the information and how you come to the information. And if you come to the information in the context of a confidential conversation, that has to be respected. It doesn't. The law doesn't agree with you. Well, the law says you have a responsibility to report a crime. Not unless you have reasonable excuse not to. And you think that's a reasonable yes. excuse? A man who is raping children? In the context of his right to silence, that's the dilemma we have to deal with. McGrath wasn't removed from the order for many years. Shortly after he was spirited out of the country, the mother of one of his victims confronted the head of St John of God at its headquarters in Sydney. That was a difficult day. Uh, I went into the main office and Joseph Smith came out and he said, come into my room. Jason Van Dyke's mother, Janice, wanted answers. Her son had finally broken down and admitted what had happened to him at Kendall Grange. I started taking drugs and drinking and, and trying to self-medicate. And then basically when I turned 18, I was killing myself and I kept, you know, I was going downhill. And I told her. We were in the car and I said, this is what happened. 
Joseph Smith's response to Janice's complaint was remarkable. I said to him, Jason's been abused by Bernard McGrath. And he then said, oh, well, I know because another boy has come forward six months earlier. And I was like taken aback. And then he described to me how he went, took McGrath, took him to America. He was going to get treatment. He'd be well looked after. And I said, but what about Jason? And he said, oh yes, go and get treatment for Jason. He will need to see a counsellor. As Bernard was getting treatment, it was all like, go and get him Jason treatment and uh, send me the bills. How much did Smith ask you about Jason and how he was? Didn't ask me anything. Didn't want to know. He was more worried about Bernard McGrath, I've got to say. At the end of his treatment in America, Joseph Smith called McGrath to offer him a choice. Joseph Smith wanted to speak to me and said the police from Christchurch were wanting to interview me in Sydney and that they weren't going to go for extradition if I chose not to come back. So Smith was giving you the opportunity not to face justice, but to remain at large in the United States. Well, as you say, that way, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. McGrath himself chose to return to Australia. He would never be free of the law again. After guilty verdicts on 51 offences, McGrath was finally sentenced in this, his fifth trial in November 2019. I impose an aggregate sentence of 27 years imprisonment. The earliest date the offender is eligible to apply for release to parole is the 22nd of December, 2044. Thank you, Your I will adjourn. McGrath's superiors have never been held to account for their complicity in his crimes. They knew what he was capable of, but still protected him. Former head of the order, Brian O'Donnell, moved him to Australia to a fresh group of vulnerable children. Another former head, Joseph Smith, moved him out of the country, out of the reach of police and parents. And the current head of the order, Timothy Graham, refused to be interviewed and offered a minimal response to our questions on behalf of McGrath's victims. Ahead of his 2019 summit on child sex abuse, Pope Francis welcomed St. John of God's global leadership into the heart of the Vatican. Pictured among the Pope's honored guests were Brian O'Donnell and Joseph Smith. The reticent Timothy Graham was there with them. The leadership of St. John of God continues to enjoy the Pope's favor their lives and reputations apparently untouched by the pain of hundreds of victims and hundreds more heartbroken families. There's a lot of other people out there that can't even speak, let alone speak up for what happens to them in them places. Huh. I don't know how them brothers can sleep at the night. The surviving victims of St. John of God are left to manage the destruction wrought on their lives. The damage to their childhood selves was so profound that few will ever recover. On my 14th birthday, I discovered alcohol. So with alcohol in my system, I couldn't care less what he did. Took these, the pain, bad memories. Tried to drown them out with alcohol, and that didn't work. And nothing would release the pain. I reckon it was something that should never have happened. It stuck my life. That's one word, you know. And I mean, if I had had a bloody education, I would have been 
a lot further on than I am now. 65 years old I am, and I'm still going through the crap. It should have not been that situation. Shame on the New Zealand government for doing what they done to me. Shame. You just need to be bloody ashamed of yourselves. I hope they hear that. I'll tell you that now. Madam Chair, perhaps after such um, intense um, material that we've all viewed, time to take a break. Yes. But to keep things on track, if we could come back to begin the closing addresses at 10 to 12. Certainly. Before we do, though, I think I need to acknowledge the makers of the, of the documentary. Yes. I just want to acknowledge uh, Niall Fulton and Sarah Ferguson, the makers of that uh, very powerful documentary, um, I want to thank in particular Niall Fulton uh, because I am aware that um, he has given great assistance uh, to the inquiry. He's volunteered um, all his time and his expertise uh, and he has created material particularly uh, for us giving a New Zealand uh, dimension uh, to the material that we've seen. And so I want to pu publicly thank them uh, for that very powerful an important part of our investigation. <laughs>